and I'm also teaching Sunday school today, so pray for me. Right, and uh, on my last lesson, what I had talked about, I started on this kind of a series. I guess I'm going to be on this for a while, maybe about love, just in general about love. It's a really broad topic, and you could talk about this for for forever. I mean, but this is my part two of that, and this lesson is centered on falling in love. So basically, I'm teaching a lesson on falling in love, and you can infer a lot in uh, in this about marriage, and I'm going to be making some comparisons to marriage, um, because Paul did that too, and uh, so I'm going to be getting into that aspect of it, but mostly I'm talking about us falling in love with the Lord. So, uh, as I said last time, my statement is this, I love to love and I hate to hate, and I, if I have a decision to make when I have to choose between the two and I have an interaction with somebody that's not going so well, I try to gravitate towards the side of loving them and, and having the right kind of reaction to just just have a loving response, even if theirs isn't very loving sometimes. We all have those things because, you know, love is a choice. And we choose to love the Lord. We choose to, to read His Word. We choose to come to church. All those things are a personal choice that we make. And I believe this. I can't find it in the Scripture. I don't know exactly how to support it. But my own belief about this is that love is depending on free moral agency. It's all about choice because... If it weren't for that, we'd just be robots. If God didn't make us with free moral agency, we'd just be robots and just being forced into something. So it wouldn't be really love. So love has a lot to do with choice. So, and before I get more into the lesson, I want to go ahead and pray and ask the Lord <coughs> to bless this uh, lesson. Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, uh, blessing this uh, Sunday school lesson here and all the others downstairs. Just give us understanding of your word and let me be a help and encouragement, not be an offense to anybody in the things that I say about Bible reading. But I believe you've laid it on my heart, and I just want to go with what you've given me to, to teach. And I pray you just let it be a blessing, and, and I pray you just spark uh, that interest in everybody here, Lord, that's maybe not reading the, your word every day, that we'd begin doing that and be more sincere about it. And I pray you just bless uh, the lesson. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, <clears throat> so really fall in love with the Lord first. I think, uh, yeah, this is right. Okay, I thought I might have skipped a slide. This is Brother Branham here on the message Abraham. Listen, first you've got to be born again of the Spirit of God. If you're not, you'll never understand the Word of God. God has said so. God said, I have hid the Bible from the wise and prudent and will reveal it to babes such as will learn. If you want to get anything from God, just be a baby. Open up the Bible. Fall in love with Jesus. That's my whole lesson. So if you don't hear anything else I say, that's the point of the entire lesson. Open up the Bible, fall in love with Jesus. I'm talking about falling in love. Amen. And the number one way that I know to do that, all these other things enter into it. Okay, when I'm talking about Bible reading, I'm also talking about reading the message, listening to the message, meditating on the Word of God, praying, um, you know, and fellowship with other believers, of course, coming to church and listening to the Word here. But I'm focusing on the concept of daily Bible reading. Um, I've always talked about this. I've always talked about seek ye first the kingdom of God in almost every lesson. And I feel like maybe I can leave that and go to something else. Maybe I'm, maybe people are tired of hearing it. Until Brother Luis, I guess you say Luis Angel Uman, I think that's how you say it, came from Peru. And I believe God sent him here, to not just to this church, but to our country, to tell us a bunch of Americans, start reading the Bible again to listen to the message. He said, he stood up here over and over again the whole day. He was going back and saying, look, you've got the message, you've got the Bible, you've got it in so many formats, you've got your audio Bible, you've got so many versions of the Bible, you've got Brother Bannon's whole entire message in your language, and uh, you got it in print form, you've got it in book form, I mean in uh, a tape form. <clears throat> There's really no excuse, okay, to not read the Bible and listen to the message and so forth every single day. Okay, so if I can move out of your way, whatever, I know, look, I know he, he asked for a raise of hands and said, who's read the Bible cover to cover? And so few people raised their hand. But I realized that a lot of people might have been bashful and, and just didn't want to brag. So there should have been more hands went up, probably. And then maybe some of you haven't read it cover to cover, but you read it on a regular basis. That's good. You don't necessarily have to read the Bible cover to cover. I'm just saying have a regular routine of reading the Bible. 
because I feel like maybe Satan has cast a spell on people's eyes and made them think because they're in the message, they're okay because we're at Spoken Word Church, we're okay, we don't need to read the Bible. And if you look at it like it's an option, then you may not do it. But I never, for since 1999, I started my daily Bible reading in 1999, never once did I get up and say, am I going to read the Bible today? No, it's just automatic. I just do it like I breathe air. It's just automatic. I never give it a second thought, you know, not once. So if you think about it like breathing air, I've never missed a day of breathing air. Since 1984, I've breathed air every day, several times a day, and I do it sincerely. There's no problem with having a routine if you're sincere. And I look at it like breathing air because it's necessary to sustain my natural life. Bible reading is necessary to sustain your spiritual life. You need it like you need breath. You need it like you need food. Brother Wade makes the analogy about the baby. If you uh, have a healthy, beautiful baby, but you close it up in the closet and don't feed it, it'll die. Another condition of a baby is you could, it can be malnourished. It can be eating, but not quite enough. So that's, to me, a Christian, if you just come to church and hear the word being preached, but don't go home during the week and meditate on it and read your Bible, listen to sermons, you're going to be malnourished, so you won't grow. You won't bear fruit. So you will just kind of sustain life, but barely. You know, so it's such an important thing to read the Bible since the last 23 years of daily Bible reading. I can look back at so many things in my life, choices I've made, experiences I've had, and everything revolves around that daily Bible reading. That's why I'm so adamant about this. Um, it, it is just so essential, so fundamental, so and, and really, really necessary. So don't look at it every day like, well, I guess I, I guess I'm not going to do it today, Lord. I guess I don't have time to breathe there today, Lord. I'm a little bit too busy. I've got too many things to do. Or whatever your excuse is, you gotta you gotta really look at your own life and say what is, what's getting in my way, what's stopping me from reading the Bible every day. And if you don't think you need to, I, that's what I'm trying to really address today is is the need for it, and make sure you realize it is a necessity. It's not just a good thing to do. I was a Baptist when I started reading the Bible every day. I was 15, and in the Baptist church, it's it's not really pushed on anybody. It's not something that anybody feels like they need to do, but a lot of us wanted to do it. I knew a lot of Baptists that read the Bible. I think Brother Luis came to the message as a Baptist and a Bible reader. As I recall, I think I remember him testifying about that. Brother Dell had already read the Bible when he came to the message. So a lot of folks in the Baptist church do it. I don't know why it's not so much done in the message. And I feel like maybe it might be a misunderstanding of predestination. Because predestination is taught right from this church. But if you misunderstand it and you think that God just handpicked you and he's pushing you through a pipe, you're going no matter what, maybe you won't read the Bible. If you quit looking at it like that, I look at it like this. If you're predestinated, you will read the Bible. If you're predestinated, you will listen to sermons. And if you're really born again, you really will because that was unlikely as a Baptist kid that I would do that since I wasn't even told to do it. Nobody told me it was necessary even come to church. It's just like all we believed in get saved you know pray the sinner's prayer you got your ticket so to speak you're set for life once saved always saved doesn't matter if you come to church doesn't matter if you read the bible but yet there was a hunger in me that's why i started doing it i wanted to know the lord i fell in love with him and i wanted to know him and that's why i started my bible reading Amen. so if that if you approach god on that basis fall in love open your bible and just continue to fall in love with the lord it'll work okay it'll be very effective here's just paul talking about husbands uh, Husband, head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church. He's making comparisons between this love for God and, you know, our love in marriage. So by showing you that, I'm just saying, you know, I'm kind of giving myself license to talk back and forth between the two. Because I don't want you to think I'm trying to belittle uh, agape love and, and say it's just like, at best you could say, I guess filial love is a type of agape love, but agape love is so far superior to filial love. So, and our love for the Lord should be so far superior to our love for spouse and family and so forth. So, uh, Gavin, I've been reading this devotional uh, called The Love Dare. If you haven't got this, you married couples, I highly recommend it. So, I've already skipped quite of my things I was going to say here. Let's see. It's about, what was that author? Oh, Sorry. It's written by, uh, you can look it up probably on Amazon. We got it from the library. But anyway, it's Stephen and Alex Kendrick. So you can look that up if you are interested in getting that book. It's a really good book to read. It's a devotional. 
and it's what married couples can do together. And this is just one that I picked, day 48. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you, Ephesians 4. Kindness is love in action. These are really wordy statements here, these really good little nuggets. Kindness is love in action. Kind of like works is faith expressed. So, so you know, you have works of uh, things like because you believe, you do works. You know, you, you uh, do things for the Lord because of your faith. So uh, really works, you know, faith without works is dead. I mean, you, if you really have faith, you'll do works. You'll, like I say, you'll read the Bible and you'll, you know, do other things for the Lord. Kindness is like that, okay? Kindness is love in action. If you love, in this case, I'm talking about the Lord. But if you love even your spouse, you'll do things out of kindness, grace, you know, acts of kindness that you display to that person. If patience is how love reacts in order to minimize a negative circumstance, then kindness is how love acts to maximize a positive circumstance. You really have to think about some of these statements. They're really deep. Patience avoids a problem. Kindness creates a blessing. One is preventative. The other is proactive. These two sides of love are the cornerstones on which many of the other attributes are built. Love makes you kind. Kindness makes you likable. When you're kind, people want to be around you. They see you as being good to them and good for them. It also is contagious. When someone demonstrates genuine kindness for you, it makes you want to do the same in return. But a person who is loving and mature won't always wait to respond in kindness. They'd rather be the first to show it. Are you that kind of person in your home with your spouse? What would happen in your marriage if the Ephesians 4 passage mentioned above became your standard operating procedure? Consider how your vertical relationship with God should directly guide and impact your horizontal, horizontal relationship with others. So, so much of our love for the Lord and our, our uh, acts of love toward Him and it should kind of you know, spill over into other areas of your life with your children, with your spouse, and so forth. So, really fall in love with the Lord first. Let me just pause for one second here because I'm going too fast. And as I mentioned a while back, um, you know, a lot of this is about keeping open channels. You know, I want to keep every facet or every channel open between me and the Lord so He can speak to me. That's, I'm always adamant about doing that. So, you know, every, every day there should be other things involved. You know, um, other things like, you know, like I said, listening to sermons. Don't neglect that. When I came to the message, I didn't put my Bible down, and nor do I, you know, I don't leave one for the other. I, do, I read them both every day, okay? That's very important. Okay. So Calvary was the ultimate expression of love. John 15, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And last time I also talked about the condescension of God, brought condescension of his attributes, his great faith, came all the way down to just believing like a child, where we can understand it. His great love came down to this form of filial love, where we could grasp it, we could begin to understand it. You know, because marriage is so much like a, a love lesson. That's what this, this whole entire series is about, love lessons. Learning to love through marriage and other relationships, it's a lot about learning to love, including loving our love for the Lord. Matthew 18, except you be converted and become as a little child, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So um, I've heard it said, I'm, I'm a truck driver, not a business guy, but I've heard it said, you know, best practices. You kind of, in business, you kind of emulate what other people are doing if, if it works. And you do the same thing they're doing, you get the same results. So look at, I look at brother and sister Dale. Um, I consider them to be successfully married. They are my definition of successful marriage because they've been married not just so long, but because they're still sweethearts. Brother and sister Tatum were an example to me. Um, when I was younger, Sister Janet took some of us young people to their house, and I got to see firsthand what real sweethearts are like. And so you, you look at these married couples who are successful, and then you try to do what they're doing. And one thing I know that they do, in one way or another, they put Christ in their marriage. It's not supposed to be just husband and wife on a joint venture. It's supposed to be Christ in the marriage. And I do that, I mean, Gabby do that by reading the Bible together. But if you even just talk about the Lord together, you know, that's, that accomplishes that to me, I believe. Part of our daily devotion time to the Lord should include meditation on Him and on His Word that He has revealed to us. Meditation on His Word coupled with prayer and singing praises to Him will cause us to fall more in love with Him. 
So somewhere have a place where you meet with the Lord. It doesn't have to be you set aside four hours a day, and you know, because I know people don't have time for that. Incorporate it into your daily routine, whatever you do, you know, into your driving, into your doing dishes. You can always be listening to a sermon, meditating on the Word of God um, while you're doing anything, really. There's so many mindless chores we do. I call them mindless chores because you don't need a lot of concentration to do some of the things we do every day. And that you can incorporate this. Somehow be playing a sermon, be singing to the Lord, do something, you know, for the Lord at all, all the time. And if you're not reading the Bible, also I would say this. When I was 15, I didn't read five chapters a day. I started off reading like one chapter a day. But as you do that, you begin to fall in love with the Lord and you want to read more and you want to read more. And then you gradually want to do more as your love increases. But the point is, you got to start this somewhere. There has to be a time. If you're not reading the Bible at all, one chapter a day is better than nothing. So start there. So simple. Read one chapter a day at least. You know, This is also an effective method in marriage. Think about your spouse sometime each day while singing love songs, wedding songs. Think about when the two of you first fell in love, your first date, your first meeting in life. Never lose that love you had. Never leave that sweetheart stage. Likewise with the Lord, never lose your first love for him. Always remember when he saved you, the first time you realized you were forgiven for your sins, every time he revealed something to you, etc. So real love comes from God. Real love is like a seed in your heart. If it's genuine, you plant it in good ground, a heart of faith, water at the word, and it'll grow stronger. Also, uh, I believe, too, an aspect of love that maybe we don't think about a lot of times is getting to know somebody, really intimately getting to know somebody, and you fall in love more. And in this case, most of them talking about our love of the Lord. That's why I read his word, because I want to know him. And in that, I'll begin to fall more in love with him. And the same thing applies to marriage. <clears throat> our love for God, our love for our spouse should grow stronger every day. This is accomplished by cultivating that seed of love you planted when you got married. And there I have a picture of the two, that couple there reading the Bible together. I know not everybody may be able to do that um, for one reason or another. But, um, you know, if you can, I highly recommend that daily Bible reading together, not to replace your individual reading, of course, because I still read my own, I have my own devotional, but Gavin and I read every day together um, our Bible and listen to sermons together and read Things like I showed you, that devotional book, uh, Spurgeon. We like to read a lot of different Christian authors, Pilgrim's Progress, things like that. Those are all really good, but especially read your Bible together. At least, like I said, at least a chapter a day. Likewise, our love for the Lord should grow stronger every day by cultivating the seed of his word, sowing it down, watering it with more word and faith, believing it. Also giving God constant praise, prayers, fellowship with other believers that stimulates spiritual growth and love for the Lord to increase. So, selflessness. Philippians 2, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look, not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. 1 Corinthians 13, charity suffereth long and is kind, charity envieth not, it vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, and endureth all things. So really, again, more slides about really falling in love with the Lord. This has to be more than affection. You know, in my early journey, I started, I had this like feeling of love for the Lord, and that's good, but it's got to be stronger than that. Same thing in marriage, you know, you start off with this little puppy love stage, but it's got to go beyond that. So it's got to be something stronger and it's got to be more intimate and real and has to be based on something besides just affection, you know. Right. After realization you are really a sinner bound for hell, but Christ died to save you, you will really appreciate him and begin to fall in love with him. So after, uh, let's see. That's the same, that's a repeat. This starts a cycle that continues throughout your entire Christian journey. You love him, seek him, realize more that uh, what he has done for you, and fall more in love with him. Uh, this real love will cause you to seek him more and become more like him, grow up the stature of a perfect man. Now, this is a quote from Brother Wade from just a couple months ago, July. The Holy Ghost is the most important thing in your life. Whether you got it or not, you've got to know that you know that you know before you can even start with these virtues. But listen... With the Holy Ghost, you can catch up real quick because God said he wouldn't leave anybody behind if you make yourself available. That's the key.
That's what I'm talking about. I'll promise you, God will give it to you. He'll pour it in if you'll just if you just want it bad enough. Amen. Brother Bob from last month. How do I know my name was written on the Lamb's Book of Life? Because you're acting it out now. Whether or not your name is written is determined by your reaction now, present tense. What's happening right now, but to think that God has a place reserved for you because he knew your reaction right now, how it would be. He knew when it was offered to you if you would respond or not. You know, uh, my statement for a while has been, I've been saying this. Um, you don't have to sit and wonder if you're predestinated. Open the Bible and prove it. Open the Bible, search the scriptures, and then you think you have eternal life, right? That's what Jesus said. So genuine love will spill over into other areas of your life. I said that a while ago, parenting and marriage and so forth. Uh, this is Brother Banner from Jehovah Jireh, number three. That's the way it is with God. We're not trying to study some newspaper standpoint, standpoint, some theological standpoint, but fall in love with him. Get down and really get him in your heart. The love of God shed abroad in the heart by the Holy Ghost. Then go to reading the Bible, and you'll see it coming right out between the lines. You see, you know what, what he's saying. He never said it right out in the word. Just thank the Father because he, he had hid those things from eyes of wise and prudent. Wise and prudent. So, John 14, if you love me, keep my commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp. That was uh, Psalm 119. Uh, this one is. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. God sent, uh, this is what I was saying a while ago. I just didn't know if I'd get to it, so I jumped the gun. God sent a minister here from Peru, Brother Luis, uh, to remind us to read the Bible and the message. That was quite a rebuke. And, uh, you know, that God would have to send somebody from another country, a third world country, where they maybe don't even have all the messages, send it here where we do have all the sermons and remind us, you need to be reading it. <laughs> you know, because he goes to a lot of other churches and he got in trouble. He just thought, talking about getting in trouble with other ministers and things. And I guess about bringing that kind of thing out, just kind of making people mad, you know, but we need to read it. Brother Bannum not only spoke English, but he spoke our dialect. You know, he's Southern hillbilly Kentucky English. I mean, there's no reason. And I guess that's really why... Because as Jesus said, uh, a prophet is not without honor, save among his own country and among his own kin. So because he's at our back door up here in Kentucky, and because he's just a southerner, I guess we tend to say, oh, that's just Brother Branham. No, that's uh, a message. Brother Dale's always saying, we've had a message. We've had a message. Right. And we just need to dig into it. Perhaps we take for granted the mighty word of God delivered to us through such a simple Kentucky man. Matthew 13, and they were offended at him, but Jesus said unto them, the prophet is not without honor. I just quoted that. All right. Brother Luis Human's message was simple. In essence, he was saying God, God's promises are on conditions. You don't automatically receive them by being in the message. This is not automatic, okay? Just because you're here. You know, I came here from the Baptist church, but I've been studying the message in the Bible. I didn't just show up, you know. We must attach ourselves to the word by reading prayer, listening to sermons, like our life depends on it because it does. Daily Bible reading is enormously important to a child of God. It's absolutely necessary for spiritual growth. Like a newborn baby must eat to grow, we must eat spiritually to grow, and a sufficient amount of spiritual food is necessary. Uh, let's see, skip on down. This message to Abraham, God will reveal it to babes such as will believe. If you want anything from God, just be a baby. Open up the Bible and fall in love with Jesus. So this is Brother Dale from uh, the message, Brotherly Kindness, from a series being born again back in this month. Actually, it was about five years ago, 2018. So in the spiritual children, you've got to get to eat the word of God, study the word of God, you know, pray and seek God and ask him to reveal these things to you instead of just saying, oh, I believe that. Let it be a part of you. And if you have the new birth, you will desire it, right? Is that what we read? You'll desire the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby because, see, that will be a part of your life. Why wouldn't you want to grow in Christ? Why would you not want not that to be a desire to, to know more about God? Uh, I think of Brother Zach Black. He got born again, and almost the next thing I remember him testify about was a dream that he had where he was eating, right? He was eating a meal, and he kept eating and eating, couldn't get full. To me, it's obvious. The Lord's telling him, you're born again, a newborn babe. Now you need to eat, and that's what he does. I meet him at work all the time. He's got that Bluetooth on, listening to sermons. Same, same thing I'm doing. We're both feeding on the Word of God constantly, and that's why I started in the Baptist church. Nobody told me I needed to read the Bible. I, I didn't even think it was necessary. I thought it was just a good thing to do, but it's not just a good thing to do. It's, necess it's a necessity. Really, it is for your growth. If you're really born again, you'll desire it, and you'll really want to, to get into Christ. Uh, musicians can go ahead and come.
These are some reasons I'll probably try to get into this more next time. Why people don't read the Bible. These are some things that I think of maybe people have as excuses. Um, I don't have time. I read it before. I don't understand it. It's too simple to be of value. You know, we, we, we make it. It's always God in simplicity. God hides and reveals himself in simplicity. Bible reading just seems like such a simple thing to do. We think, ah, just, just my Bible. I'll read it tomorrow. It'll be there tomorrow. I'll read it whenever. You, or you feel unworthy. I was still addicted to pornography when I started reading my Bible. That's how I overcame pornography as a 15-year-old kid. I didn't even know about sanctification. I started reading my Bible every day, and pornography in about six months left. And it hasn't been back since 25, about 25 years ago or 24 years ago. No relapse. I didn't suppress it. It's gone. Uh, profanity. I was using cuss words until about a year after I started reading my Bible. It left. Okay? This is, you, f you may feel unworthy. Start doing it. Watch what happens. Don't, we don't want to become a routine. Again, I say I breathe out of routine, but I'm sincere when I do it. We all breathe and eat and everything else we do in life is routine, but that's no excuse not to read the Bible. Just do it and do it with sincerity. And that's all I have for today. God bless you all.